but you know, <coughs> I dare not press it. Um, I think, uh, as we've sort of said, this is uh, my first one too, and it is quite a nerve-wracking experience. <laughs> All of a sudden, the slides advance, but uh, it's been termed as uh, death by PowerPoint. Somebody said it was to avoid death by PowerPoint. Somebody said it actually is death by PowerPoint. <laughs> so, uh, first slide. Um, Nathan talked about workflows. Mark talked about saving 20% cost. So, information modeling efficiencies is really important. Where are the gaps? Where do we see the efficiencies? And it's very much about the right data at the right time. I wasn't expecting to be the slide. <laughs> um, I hope some of you can see at the back the, the, de the, the words on it. But it all starts with the client, with the employee's requirements. Um, and from that, we generate a BIM execution plan. And it's then moving into the information modeling. And sometimes this is a seamless process, but as we probably have all found so far, generally it's not. So the employer's requirements, um, we all get asked by our clients, can you give us some BIM? Um, and we all know that often they don't actually know what they're asking for, what they're talking about. So it's, it's how we educate back and we develop with our clients to help them understand what the benefits are. So then we move on and we produce this execution plan. But very often it's produced in isolation of the, of the client, of the employer's requirements. And you know we need to avoid it being an empty execution plan where we all go off on a tangent and produce <coughs> what we think they want, not what they actually want. So for me, it's about joining those up. It's how we sit with the client <coughs> to develop the execution plan and inform them about what the benefits are that they can achieve through the BIM process. So we manage their expectations and we produce a dynamic execution plan that can evolve as the modeling starts. So we move on the workflow to the um, information modeling. So if we've got the right robust brief and the right robust execution plan, then what we model hopefully is a lot more meaningful. And it's about the level of data we add in. All too often, and the slide, it actually drops off the screen. And this is what, what I've found has happened, is we model what we think people want within the design team and the client, not actually what is needed or what is required. <coughs> so it's about the right information, the right data at the right time. So we start modeling. Uh, initially, once we've uh, got to this project information model, it's a bit like, and Frank says, wheeling the Trojan horse in. And it's full of data, but we need to make sure that we get the data out at the right place at the right time. Um, and very often we don't even wheel the horse into the right area, which is where we often go wrong at the start. Um, so we then look at the asset information model. Um, the client is where they're really going to reap the benefits, and we talked about earlier, you know, the amount of level of cost and time that go into that. So it's about this being an integrated model. It's about wheeling the FM in early doors to make sure that the design model is informed. So we de the design model is what we're going to build, which is what Nathan said. So we start with a design intent model, which is all well and good, and there's been a lot of discussions about this today. So that's you know structural architecture M and E, but why not you know landscape architecture? Let's bring more people into the field, and then we have a virtual construction model that we're going to build from, and hopefully there's an overlap. Um, and it's that overlap where the efficiencies can be created. And I'll come back a bit later and hopefully focus in on that and how we can generate some of those efficiencies. The asset information model. We need an asset register. Um, and why not include that within the model? That doesn't need to be something that's generated separately. You know, this is something that, again, where the efficiencies can start to be created within the process. Just gonna have a pause to get my breath, um, and you know it's then how that information flows onto the operation and the maintenance of the building. And if we get this seamless flow of information and we get the efficiencies, that's the only way we're going to generate this 20% cost saving. Um, we're all struggling to make the efficiencies work, I think, at the moment, but we can see where they are. So I just wanted to focus in on the project information model. 
and from an M&E perspective, how do we move from design to construction? And it's very often a, an inefficient process at the moment. There's too much data at the wrong time, and it's not handed over, and there's a lot of wastage. So that's the crossover for me, is the, it, 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 is the middle area there that's shaded in. And it's a, where the efficiencies lie. And for me as an M&E designer, that's my stage F1 detailed design, is that little blue bit in the middle. So what lies either side of that within the model? There's a, there's a, a stage E model, which is nicely coordinated with a bit of luck. Um, then there's this stage F1 chunk in the middle, where we go into this further, we add data, we add detail. And then the contractor picks it up, the subcontractor picks it up, and they produce a, a construction model. But they throw away our model, our F1 model, which is the yellow bit in the middle. So is there a way that we can avoid producing that so that we can create an efficiency? Can we produce a stage E model which ultimately will transpose better to a stage F2 construction model? So we create an efficiency in the middle where we're not doing something that we're not brilliant at, we're leaving that to the subcontractor, but we produce a better design model. Um, and what that means ultimately is that when the subcontractor produces the model, you know, we get that seamless overlay and we create an efficiency. But it's again, it's about the right level of data, whether that's generic, whether that's um, specific, and getting that balance absolutely right. And then the efficiencies will hopefully start to fall out. Um, ultimately, you know, that, that's just one area and hopefully that creates a, a final picture with a more efficient workflow. I think there's a, there's a similar situation when you come to the asset model and how far you can merge those two models together and also whether there's a sector in between the asset register and the maintenance model where we can again create another efficiency.